Yeah. Right, so uh, good morning everyone. Morning. 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 Uh, we're going to start off the day with the, the gloomy subject of dystopian fiction, which uh, I hope doesn't make anyone else's uh, hangover worse. It's already made my hangover <coughs> worse uh, already. But, uh, that, that's my silly fault for having too much to drink last night. Um, over the last few months I've ploughed through our team um, grim futures predicting a world of oppression, alienation uh, and catastrophes. I started out reading the more literary ones, like um, Zami Artin's We. If, I'm not sure I pronounced that right. I'll be pronouncing lots of names wrongly later on, so uh, get it off first uh, started. So uh, yeah, I started out reading uh, the more literary dystopias, like Zami Artin's We and uh, Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. But uh, I, I quickly slid downwards towards the cheesy end of the market and ended up uh, zonked out in front of the telly watching uh, Logan's Run in 2012. Um, <laughs> And if you look at the way dystopian fiction has developed over the years, it sort of goes in that direction anyway. Um, but I, I'm not trying to say that my, my talk's going to be lightweight or just sort of focusing on uh, cheesy feature films, but uh, uh, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, what I'll be discussing is what kind of messages uh, about society can be made through uh, speculative fiction, whether highbrow or more populist. So uh, the future is a natural setting for writers wanting to explore uh, how developments in culture, government or technology might affect how people think and behave. But, uh, and this is the important bit, any dystopia isn't really about the future. Instead it reflects the fears and concerns around in the time in which it was written. So what my talk is really about, it's, it's a, sort of an incomplete history of ideas. It'll be about uh, the preoccupations and fears that uh, people like us have had over the last hundred or so years. I'll be going to some detail about three or four dystopias and mentioning quite a few more along the way. Um, if I don't say much about a particular work and you'd like to know more about it, then uh, you can look it up in my Pessimist's Guide to the Future, which uh, I'll hand out at the end to anyone interested. I'll be using a fairly wide definition of what a dystopia is. Um, I'll be covering fictional societies that are in some way worse than ours, um, rather than just those with an oppressive regime. Um, others use terms like anti-utopia, counter-utopia, or cacotopia, uh, whatever that is, uh, either interchangeably with dystopia, or to mean something subtly different. Uh, the same goes with uh, post-apocalyptic fiction, which other people, media studies students, and they're like, they're, they're sort of grouped together differently. But what I'll be doing is I'll be lumping everything together under the term dystopia. So any bleak, horrible, nasty, evil future um, is, a, is a dystopia for the purposes of this talk. So, um, a dystopia is an alternative, often a future society. Sometimes it will be very much like the real world, with just some aspects of it distorted or exaggerated. In other works, the whole structure of the society may be different from ours, or imagined technological advances will have had an impact on society. So, the writer has to describe how their hypothetical society all fits together. So, when you're reading it or watching the film, it sort of seems coherent and plausible. So the writer would ask, what social institutions are dominant? Uh, does power belong to a fascist elite or to multinational corporations? Or has some kind of uh, catastrophe weakened the threads which hold the society together? What is the, the culture of the society? Uh, what is forbidden and what is encouraged? What beliefs or mindset does its population have? The writer will tend to explore their imagined society through the eyes of the central character. And usually in a dystopia, the central character will start to see something dangerous or false about the, the world in which they're living in. The protagonist will therefore be the, the figure which the, the audience or the reader most identifies with, because the, the objections the reader will come to have to the society they're reading about will tend to be similar or the same to the objections that the protagonist in the, in the book or the film will have. Usually, the protagonist hears about some sort of resistance movement, uh, that, that sort of crops up in near enough every dystopia, uh, but not everyone. And the protagonist will try to gain contact, you know, join the resistance, work to overthrow the fictional society, that kind of thing. There's probably some wish fulfilment going on here uh, as well. The, the reader would like to think they could or would be a heroic rebel fighting against an oppressive regime like uh, Guy Montag in Fahrenheit 451 or V in V for Vendetta. But, you know, you could say um, this, this might be pointless. You know, why bother vicariously fighting against fictional oppression 
where we should be fighting against the class system in real life. Um, but the, I can't read my writing, sorry. The, uh, the answer is that dystopias help to clarify what we should be fighting against in the real world. So uh, dystopias can act as a warning or as a way of highlighting trends within capitalism through a, a slippery slope argument. Usually uh, a dystopia extrapolates an existing trend within society and takes it to its logical or illogical conclusion. Uh, something which the writer finds uh, annoying or troubling, like uh, CCTV cameras, for example, or, or advertising or the threat of a catastrophe, uh, becomes dominant in a dystopia. And uh, exaggerating trends like this in the real world can uh, be a clear way of highlighting uh, problems through a dystopia. Most fiction is driven by the central characters making choices. What they decide to do is what moves the, the plot along. Uh, broadly, well, very broadly, these choices can be boiled down to choosing between what's right and what's wrong in the in the writer's uh, um, according to the writer's beliefs. In uh, speculative fiction, which includes both utopias and dystopias, um, society itself has made that choice, or, or a series of choices. In utopian fiction, such as uh, uh, William Morris's News from Nowhere, or uh, Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward. Society has made the right choice, again according to the writer, but um, in dystopian fiction, society has made the wrong choice and turned into a nightmare. Perhaps the first uh, recorded dystopia is Revelation, the last book in the Bible. This describes what its writers thought um, would happen in the last days of the world as we, uh, as we know it. In this end time scenario, Christians are magically transported up from the, the planet, um, up, to, up to heaven, leaving unbelievers in a chaotic world uh, run by the Antichrist, a representative of the, of the devil. Uh, this society isn't described in much detail in Revelation, uh, beyond the, you know, the well-known passage about uh, an economic system being based on the, the mark of the beast, you know, you can't buy or sell unless you've got a 666 tattooed on you. Uh, but it's, although uh, the Bible doesn't really go into much detail about this, this sort of end of the world scenario uh, at that point, it's uh, fairly clear that it's not supposed to be an easy or a, or a pleasant place to live. And it gets even worse when um, God takes his revenge on uh, unbelievers and uh, the Antichrist followers and launches a series of global disasters. And in fact, most of Revelation is a series of one disaster after another. Um, so for the authors of Revelation, this was what would happen if society made the, the wrong choice in, in their eyes. So partly because of the Bible's influence over the centuries, and partly because of the ongoing struggles of living in class society, the, the fear of a terrible future is one which uh, many people have carried around uh, with them. And this is uh, bound to seep through into, into fiction. So uh, the, the starting point for dystopian fiction as we know it today is uh, the late 19th century. Although well, there are sort of precursors before, but uh, that, that's, that's my starting point. By this time in the real world, the, the utopian socialists like uh, Robert Owen and Charles Fourier had established their communities where working conditions um, and facilities were better than most of the other mills and factories around at that time. Um, others had hopes that advances in technology would, um, uh, would liberate people from, uh, from drudgery. You know, machines would help people to um, you know, uh, live happier lives with, with less drudgery. That, there, was a, there was some optimism around at that time. Uh, of course, you know, as we know, it didn't sort of <laughs> work out uh, all that well, but uh, among some people in the, in the late 19th century, they were quite optimistic about you know, how developments in the future could improve things. Um, some early dystopias were responses to this kind of optimism. Uh, one example is uh, Anna Bovendold's uh, Re Republic of the Future, written in 1888. Um, this book describes a future so-called socialist America, where mechanisation has liberated people from uh, drudgery and uh, manual work. Wolfgang, the, the book's narrator, uh, is visiting from Sweden, which remains a free market capitalist country in, 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 in this world of the future. I think it's set in 2050. Although, well, the, the date doesn't really matter, but um, um, uh, it's set um, you know, over 100 years in the, in the author's uh, own uh, future. 
So Wolfgang, the, the, the books narrator, is visiting from capitalist Sweden into, into this uh, New York of the, of the future. He books into an automated hotel which lacks staff because uh, machines provide food, bedding, information, all the facilities. And he says that for a traveller bent on a pleasure trip, machinery is a substitute for a garrulous landlord and a score of servants, however bad, is found to be a poor and somewhat monotonous companion. New, bland estates of identical minimalist houses have been built, uh, with gardens which, uh, quote, no one cultivates as flower and grass entail a certain amount of manual labour, which it appears is thought to be degrading by these socialists. So, um, uh, what, what Dodd's doing here is criticising from a conservative perspective, it, it's a very conservative book, um, and her main target is uh, estate regulation, um, equality, which she sees uh, as a bad thing, and uh, automation. So she, she says that these three um, trends which she sort of thought might happen in the future would lead to a very dull society. Uh, the people within the society she describes uh, have got no ambition, no imagination, because in Dodd's belief they've got nothing to strive for. Uh, you know, it's obvious that Dodd's working from a, a different definition of socialism to one which we'd be used to in the SPGB, um, and that the book um, contains a, a powerful, albeit benign, um, state which runs things. Um, even down to deciding what you eat, you know, in, in the book. Um, uh, people come round to your house once a week, you know, take a survey of what, what, you know, your general health and, you know, how things are, and they prescribe food for you, which is then sent in from... Um, thousands of miles away through um, or, or electric conduits or, or something like that, she, she describes it. So, so in the society, everything is regulated uh, by the state. So the book reads very much like a criticism of a benevolent form of state capitalist society, if, if that could exist. I mean, there's no sort of oppression as such in, in the, the book she describes. Um, similar objections, although ones which are less conservative and of more relevance today, appear in uh, E.M. Forster's 1909 short story, The Machine Stops. Uh, this was written as a response to one of H.G. Wells's utopias, which uh, Forster thought was too optimistic about how advancements in technology would affect people's lifestyles. Uh, the story opens with a description of the sort of home where everyone is living in the society. I'll uh, read a bit here. And this is at the, the, so the, the very start of the story. Imagine, if you can, a small room, hexagonal in shape like the cell of a bee. It is lighted neither by window nor by lamp, yet it is filled with a soft radiance. There are no apertures for ventilation, yet the air is fresh. There are no musical instruments, and yet, at the moment that my meditation opens, this room is throbbing with melodious sounds. An armchair is in the centre, by its side a reading desk. That is all the furniture. And in the armchair there sits a swaddled lump of flesh, a woman about five feet high with a face as white as fungus. It is to her that the little room belongs. <laughs> um, so in, in the world of the machine stops, everyone lives in their own individual cell like this. Um, all, all underground, um, uh, everyone lives underground in this, uh, in this society. Um, society is held together by the machine, you know, capital letters, uh, you know, the, the machine, which is a, an automated, centralised organiser, which provides each cell with electricity, food, um, communication systems and other conveniences. So everyone in this world has got what they want within their own within their own little room. Um, people communicate through what's called the speaking apparatus, which is um, like a video phone, um, where they exchange trivia and gossip with each other. And this seems to be people's only activity in this uh, in this world. No one sort of works because the machine provides everything for them. And uh, furthermore, the Machine Central Committee decides where people can live and whether or not they have children. But the, the emphasis isn't really on sort of deliberate oppression by, by a central committee. That's not really what the book's about. Um, the woman mentioned in the opening paragraph uh, is called Vashti. And um, she's estranged from her son named uh, Kuno, who lives in his cell on the opposite side of the, of the world. He tells her that he plans to go outside um, to explore. And um, he uses a damaged section of the corridor near his own cell to, to find a way out. So um, he later says that when he, when he sort of escaped from his cell and went outside, he regained uh, the sense of space which their society has lost through everything being provided by machinery. E.M. Um, e. Forster is best known for writing uh, film-friendly novels like um, uh, Passage to India or uh, Room with a View. 
And The Machine Stops was his only venture into speculative fiction. It's a shame he didn't write more, because it's, it's, well uh, it's well worth reading. Uh, but in his other writings, uh, Forster explored um, social differences between the classes. But um, what the, the Machine Stops does is it, it focuses on another tenet of Marxism, uh, alienation. Um, by using machines to provide basic necessities, and uh, especially as an intermediary in communication, uh, Forster is saying that people risk uh, being alienated from one another. Um, the uh, Vashti's distant, clumsy relationship with her son Kuno is the, the main example in the story. The relationships she is most comfortable with are those with her thousands of friends she trades ideas like her commodities with over the speaking apparatus. Um, now at the time Forster was writing, uh, telephones were, were fairly widely available, at least to, at least to wealthy people. And uh, radio was uh, just being developed. So um, in the book, the, the speaking apparatus is his sort of extrapolation of what was around at the time. But if the story were written today, uh, Forster would clearly be referring to social networking sites like uh, MySpace and Facebook, which is now used by one in 13 of the world's population. So as I say, in, in the book, all people ever do is sit in front of <laughs> a computer trading little sort of gossipy <laughs> tidbits with one another. Um, but in, in the story, the idea is that the, the characters shared through the machine are, are sort of short lectures about subjects like Wessex or Australian music. Whereas, of course, in real life, what we're more likely to do is um, post little videos of cats playing pianos or <laughs> pop videos from 30 years ago. And, and I'm just as guilty of that as anyone. I'll, I'll, I'll inflict my musical taste on anyone who dares to have me as a friend on Facebook. <laughs> but um, what was remarkable that um, Forster is uh, preempting some current concerns with the apparent or perceived shallowness of social networking sites on the internet. But he was writing, um, you know, 100 years ago before social networking sites were, were around and, you know, a good, I don't know, um, 30, 40 years before, you know, the internet was, was even, a, you know, a, a common idea. Um, but, um, well, the, the book's got the two characters, say, Vashti, who's the, you know, if, if the book was written today, she'd be like a, you know, a geeky teenager, but in, in the book she's, um, you know, a, a mother who's estranged from her son. And in the book, um, her son's the rebellious one, he's the one who, you remember, sort of climbs outside. And um, he's, at the same time, he's fighting for more sort of meaningful, deep relationships, because he sees in, in that society that communicating over, over, you know, what we would call the internet is, is alienating. That, that's, that's clearly the way it's, uh, it's written. Um, and by relying too much on the machine, uh, Vashti and her like end up fetishising it. They, um, you know, come to believe it's something more than a machine made by people. And um, they also sort of end up worshipping it. The, the instruction manual um, of the machine in the book is treated like a Bible, for example. Um, now, the, the concepts of alienation and fetishism were discussed in Marx's 1844 Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. Although... The machine stops couldn't have been influenced by those, as they weren't published until uh, around about 1932. Um, another Marxist critique that Forster uses is the idea that the machine will crumble under the weight of its own contradictions, which again is what some people believe that capitalism you know, <coughs> could end by, although that, that's, that's debatable, but that's the, the tone in, in, in the story that he believes that the, the way the machine works, um, it, it's just too, too complicated for its own good and it will sort of trip itself up. Um, so where the machine stops stands out from other dystopias is in its clear and thorough message about the alienating effects of technology. Um, Forster's view is, is very one-sided though by just emphasising the downsides of that kind of communication. Um, in the real world, for every pasty-faced loner glued to the internet like me, there are thousands of other people using the internet to spread ideas, you know, get in contact with people who they'd otherwise not be able to get in contact with. So again, Forster's being very bleak, but you know, you can, you can cut a bit of slack, seeing as he was writing when no one had ever heard of the internet, so you know. Um, and of course these days you don't need to be cooped up in a pokey little room to use the internet, you know, when it's available on, um, you know, mobile <coughs> phones and iPads or whatever they're called. But having said that, Forster doesn't see it as a good thing that developments like automation um, and the internet can reduce labour and speed up communication between people who are otherwise distant. Um, and, and these days, only the most hardline primitivist would agree fully with Forster's account. Um, he seems to be saying that only proper face-to-face -face interaction with people 
is sort of genuine or, 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 or unalienated. And um, using a, a machine as an, as an intermediary is inevitably alienating. But th this sort of reactionary approach can be found in lots of dystopias. And um, as I started to read them, I, I realised that dystopias were maybe a bit more conservative than I otherwise would have thought. Especially the next one. Um, the, the, the downsides of technology and the machine stops. Um, can, as I say, be found in other dystopias around uh, as well. And one well-known example is the 1927 film Metropolis, which hopefully a couple of people would uh, have seen or at least be aware of. Um, this depicts a slave labour force working very long hours uh, in repetitive jobs in a high-tech city of the future. Now, um, Metropolis is amazing to watch because of its scale and its visual effects. It's still a, a great piece of filmmaking, but it's hard to find anything which is more patronising to the working class. Um, its basic message is that workers shouldn't have any ambitions at all beyond uh, mediation between the, the rulers and the working class. So in the, the message in Metropolis is that, um, well it doesn't even advocate reformism, it says that all workers should do is like communicate with their bosses, you know, that, that, that's, that's as far as Metropolis goes. Um, so we need to turn to other dystopias from round about the same time to find more interesting discussions about employment patterns and management methods. So um, the strategy of uh, scientific management or Taylorism was devised by Frederick Taylor in the last quarter of the 19th century. And what this approach aimed to do was, um, I say, it aimed to improve efficiency by strict controls over working procedures. Um, a similar management strategy is uh, Fordism, named after Henry Ford, um, who was the American founder of the Ford Motor Company. And he aimed to reduce costs by automating and standardising working practices, and in so doing he, he popularised the, the moving assembly line. Um, two dystopias in particular satirise these approaches. The, the 1921 novel by Russian writer whose name I can't pronounce, uh, it, it, Ivedni Zamyatin, I think that's, that's it. Um, Zamyatin is what I'm calling him, you know. Apologies to any Russians who you could correct me. Uh, but anyway, his, his uh, 1921 um, dystopia was called uh, We. And um, this was influenced by the Taylorist practices which um, the author saw when he was working in the shipyards of Newcastle. In We, uh, the populace of the future is controlled through a, a strict timetable of what they can do and when. Um, even having sex is only permitted to allocated sex hours. Um, but if they're being really efficient, they could have reduced this to sex half hours or sex quarter hours, you know, but, but there you go. I suppose he was being a bit more optimistic. Um, <laughs> Brave New World, which was um, written by Aldous Huxley in 1931, this, this explicitly refers to, to Fordism. Um, Henry Ford himself is elevated to the status of a deity in this society. Um, their calendar has been started again from the, the year of the first uh, Model T car to, to roll off the, the production line. And um, Christian crosses have got the, the tops cut off them, um, so they resemble a capital T, as in Model T. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the message that both uh, Zami Artin and Huxley give us is that management strategies like Fordism and Taylorism, and also their sort of modern-day counterparts, that the same argument can be used. Uh, they're saying that these, these type of employment strategies are inherently dehumanising. Both strategies aim for more productivity by treating people just like components in a larger machine. Uh, in fact, the characters in Sammy Artin's novel, they're named after specifications of one of the, the icebreaker um, ships which um, Sammy Artin built when he was working in Newcastle. However, um, these concerns about technology and management strategies were eclipsed by greater fears in the 1930s. Uh, the rise of Nazism troubled anyone capable of stringing a coherent thought together. And as the Cold War began in the late 1940s, there were also fears of the Soviet system um, spreading to Europe and America. <coughs> the most famous dystopia produced in this climate is uh, George Orwell's 1949 masterpiece, uh, 1984. Although I've, I've got a hell of a lot of time for this book, I won't sort of dwell too much on it in this talk, because everyone sort of knows 1984 fairly well, so I won't, um, I won't break over um, too much. And it, it, it's sort of difficult to find an angle on 1984, which hasn't already been discussed and explored. Uh, but having said that, I don't want to downplay the importance of 1984, as it's um, undoubtedly one of the definitive dystopias, as well as being one of the most important books written in the last century. 
In fact, um, as 1984 has become so well known, it could perhaps be called uh, a self-denying prophecy, in that it um, uh, clearly crystallised the arguments against totalitarianism. So these days, uh, um, totalitarianism, at least in the form it was around in the 1930s and 1940s, that kind of totalitarianism is, is less of a threat now. But one of the strengths of 1984 is that different parts of it continue to be relevant uh, according to changing trends in, in, in the real world. So any call for ID cards, DNA databases and so on is met with responses that, oh, this, this will lead to a 1984, an Orwellian society, a Big Brother society. And CCTV cameras are another concern and uh, featured heavily in Orwell's book only uh, a few years after they were invented. Um, these days, uh, Britain probably has more CCTV cameras than any other country. Um, I read somewhere that Britain's got more um, CCTV cameras than every other country put together, but uh, I don't know, hopefully it's not that bad. Um, uh, Liberty estimates that there are four and a half million CCTV cameras in Britain, which is one for every 14 or so people. And uh, newer cameras in London, um, especially in Westminster, um, include microphones. This is, this is true. So if you're walking around in Westminster, the CCTV cameras have got microphones to pick up on what you're saying. And um, also as well, um, some CCTV cameras have got um, uh, sort of recognition software built in, which um, when, face, uh, when sort of pointed towards a crowd, that this software can recognise individual faces. And also as well, it, it can apparently recognise um, different patterns of behaviour, whatever that means. So um, stuff like that, which Orwell didn't foresee. He didn't sort of foresee software being used with cameras. But these kinds of developments are clearly the, sort of, the sort of scary kind of developments which Orwell was warning us against. But um, 1984 doesn't only um, explore sort of stormtroopers and surveillance and that kind of totalitarianism, but um, it also explores the, the psychological tools of oppression, uh, such as the way that beliefs can be manipulated through language and uh, you know, by rewriting history or focusing hatred on the false enemy. So um, 1984 exposes and criticises most aspects of totalitarianism and the, the hundreds of dystopias written afterwards which have totalitarianism as its theme, all of them owe something to Orwell's work. Although, having said that, and it pains me to say it's about one of my heroes, but um, 1984 is very similar to a lot of Zami Yartin's We. It, um, the, the, the plot has a similar structure and the, the setting is, is similar. So um, I'm not saying Orwell plagiarised it, but it's heavily influenced by it. But through the 1950s and the 1960s, Huxley's Brave New World gained uh, more relevance um, from the development of consumerism in society. And with consumer culture came the so-called permissive society, youth culture, all these sort of trends which were developing, especially through the 60s. Uh, they became um, other targets for dystopian writers. And there are several dystopias from around this time um, uh, which sort of tap into the same kind of themes as Brave New World. And, and they include uh, Logan's Run, which was a, a 1967 novel before the film. And uh, a 1968 BBC television play called The Year of the Sex Olympics. Um, so in, in Brave New World and also in you know, similar things happen in these other 1960s um, consumerist, hedonistic type dystopias, um, the population is kept from questioning or challenging their society by um, sensuous pleasures. So in Brave New World you've got um, sex hormone chewing gum, the drug Soma and um, the, the Feelys cinemas. In, in Logan's Run, the population live only for hedonism, uh, but there's a catch because no one lives beyond their 20s. And in the year of the Sex Olympics, uh, society is kept docile by manipulative television programmes. And, and these kinds of um, dystopias, they reversed contemporary trends, uh, particularly about sexuality. So in these works, um, sexuality is much more open than in real life. And, you know, promiscuity is the norm, that, that, that kind of thing. So again, don't get weird with sort of um, these dystopias written when those changes in society were starting to happen that much quicker, you know, the, the mid to, to late 60s. So, um, in that way they seem a bit dated now because society has sort of moved on a bit. You know, you could say society has moved on in the direction of those dystopias, you know, that there is that argument. But um, the way these dystopias work is that they, um, they take, you know, normal, in invert oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing that a lot and I find it very irritating. I'll try and stop doing this whole thing. <laughs> 
but anyway, yeah, these, these dystopias, they, they focus on um, sort of inverting the, the moral standards or the, the social norms around at that time. So, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, as I say, you know, um, promiscuity has become the norm rather than, you know, what was around in the, in the, sort of the 60s, you know, sort of the aims of, of uh, repression. But um, you could say that it, it's the author's intention to claim that repressive social rules um, are right, because in the dystopias that they're writing about, where they've reversed these rules, um, you know, something wrong happens. So, you know, it could be that there's a very conservative interpretation of some of these, because they're, they're saying that if you um, take the opposite of what society's moral judgments are and moral, moral values are at the moment, if you take the opposite, then that's wrong. Therefore, you know, what's around now is right. You know, there, there's that conservative interpretation. But you could also interpret these ones in a much more, um, uh, I, I like to think, accurate way. And um, it's to say that, um, that the, these dystopias are more radical because what they're doing is they're, they're highlighting something that's just starting to change in society. And um, if it goes in too far a certain direction, then it has negative consequences. So, uh, so that they're saying that you know something is wrong about current society, and if you expand and extrapolate on that, then it gets even worse. So. On that interpretation, you know, they're saying that existing society is wrong, but it could get even more wrong, for want of a better word, if, if they continue. Um, and also in these societies as well, don't forget that what's um, previously taboo or radical, such as, you know, promiscuity, youth culture, consumerism even, um, has become a new tool of oppression. That's uh, on the more sort of radical reading of these dystopias, you know, what's... What's seen as liberating in, you know, especially in the mid-60s as, you know, all these changes were happening, can become a new tool of oppression. So what these dystopias aim to suggest is how oppression can be made to seem palatable. So to explain this fully uh, requires a bit of a, a digression. Um, Sigmund Freud argued that repression, especially of sexual instincts, was necessary to keep society um, together, you know, it's necessary for society to function in his view. Herbert Marcuse was one of Freud's critics, and in his 1955 book, Eros and Civilization, he argued that a truly free society would, embra would embrace you know, greater expressions of you know, sexuality, personality, all the rest of it. However, for Marcuse, um, capitalism wasn't this free society, because it found new ways of oppression through things like consumerism, exploiting sexuality, um, you know, that, that, that kind of development that was happening at the time, and you know, still goes on today, of course. Um, so the, the consumer culture that grew out through the 1960s found more blatant ways of, you know, using sexuality to sell products, for example. And, you know, it's helped by deregulation and increased spending power of young people. And uh, so what's happening in the 60s and 70s is what was previously taboo or radical. It starts to become assimilated into capitalism. And maybe the, the clearest example here is, uh, is what happened to punk. So, in, in, you know, in the early days, punk was, you know, a radical movement, but... You know, once the, the band started selling out and, you know, signed record contracts and, you know, once it became, you know, once you got, you know, bands on top of the pops and all the rest of it, punk had lost its radical edge. It just became another part of capitalism. And, you know, these days, you know, you can get, you know, punk-inspired clothes in any high street shop. You know, punk is used as a, um, you know, as a sort of like a, a visual style. So, you know, the, the original context of punk has been taken as, you know, the whole movement has just been assimilated into capitalism. Um, so that's what these dystopias are warning us about, because, um, well, for Mark Huser, what the most worrying de development of the 20th century is how things like this were happening, how what was previously radical becomes um, part of uh, capitalism. You know, and if, if people are preoccupied by things like consumerism, hedonism, mm. then the argument is that they're, they're less uh, likely to think about their class position, uh, less likely to act on it. So in that way, it's another tool of oppression. Personally, I think it could be hedonistic and um, revolutionary, but uh, that, that's, that's another argument. Um, so, although it's doubtful that consumerist dystopias like Logan's Run, Brave New World, etc., uh, were directly influenced by Mark Huser and his um, uh, colleagues in the Frankfurt School, they, they extrapolate the same ideas. So, in these imagined futures, television or drugs or promiscuity have become new tools of oppression. Uh, they've become central to the society so that the ruling class can use them, you know, for their own ends, uh, to distract workers. 
So the argument is that if you give people enough good times, they become apathetic and easy to control. And only in a, a post-capitalist society could things like hedonism or, you know, for want of a better word, you know, truly be free and liberating. So, um, what Logan's run and Year of the Sex Olympics, they, they picture overpopulation as the reason why um, the, the regimes described uh, keep power. And um, the, the theme of overpopulation, that crops up in quite a lot of uh, 1960s and 1970s dystopias, um, including uh, Soylent Green and something called ZPG, which I, I hope no one's heard of, because, you know, the clip on YouTube, it looks absolutely awful. But after the Second World War, the, the rate of population growth increased. And with this came concern that there wouldn't be enough resources to feed, clothe and house um, people, you know, because of the inherent um, inequalities of distribution in capitalism. And also as well, uh, wider news coverage meant that people in Europe and America could become more aware of things like famines in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, in 1968, Paul R. Elrich's book, uh, The Population Bomb, became the focus of fears of overpopulation. He predicted worldwide famines in the 1960s and 1980s. Sorry, um, he predicted famines in the 70s and 80s uh, due to population rising at a higher rate than could be matched by uh, production. Uh, the book sold over 2 million copies and became influential among academics and governments. But when the, the global famines Ulrich predicted didn't happen, or didn't happen in the extreme way he, he predicted them, um, his book was discredited, although he still personally sticks by his arguments. So perhaps as part of the backlash, uh, depopulation also became a common theme in um, some dystopias around in the, uh, especially in the 70s. So you've got the, the Omega Man, um, Survivors, Z for Zachariah, yeah. ones like that. But in, in dystopian fiction, uh, a rapid decline in population is usually the result of a major catastrophe, a, a cataclysm, rather than fears more directly linked to you know, production and uh, consumption. Now, um, an apocalyptic event has been a theme of dystopias ever since Revelation. So if you remember Revelation, that contains page after page of um, disasters which God inflicts on the world. And uh, recent Christian speculative fiction like uh, the Left Behind series, they're a bit of a throwback to this, uh, but sort of rewritten for you know, the age of the post-apocalyptic thriller. So um, apocalyptic dystopias, they don't tend to extrapolate from an existing problem in society in the same way that you know, totalitarian or alienating dystopias do. Instead they, 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 they use a, a major disaster uh, a pandemic, a nuclear war, an alien invasion even, as a quick way of changing society. And uh, the, the cause of this crisis um, changes according to contemporary fears. So throughout the Cold War, many dystopias um, used the threat of nuclear war and, um, uh, you know, as a, a basis for their um, fiction, you know, their, their fictional society. So um, we've already seen that 1984 has been uh, a powerful enough work in itself to influence resistance against totalitarianism. And in the same way, several works about the possible consequences of nuclear war um, have galvanised opposition to the uh, threat of nuclear weapons. Now, there are over a thousand dystopias which um, directly or indirectly explore the possible consequences of nuclear war. And perhaps the most well known is the, the 1965 film The War Game, um, made for the BBC by Peter Watkins. This imagined uh, Britain getting caught up in the middle of a conflict between America and state capitalist countries. And the film argued that the, the government hadn't taken sufficient steps to warn the public of you know, the, the issues surrounding nuclear war. And even if they had, um, the consequences just couldn't be, couldn't be managed. So uh, in the film, when nuclear bombs start falling on the southeast of England, um, families and emergency services alike are showing failing to cope with the resulting firestorms, explosions and all the rest of it. Um, days and weeks after the initial explosions, the, the longer term effects of shock and radiation sickness become apparent. And four months later, the film depicts uh, Britain as being stunted with a barely functioning society. People are living in squalor, some are apathetic, others are angry. Uh, dwindling food supplies are hoarded by the police and the army, leading to conflict between them and civilians. Now, I did think of showing some scenes from the war game, but uh, as you probably guess, it's way too grim for first thing on a Saturday morning. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's worth watching, but, you know, it, it's, it's not the most cheerful <laughs> film to watch, as you can imagine. In fact, for 20 years, the BBC thought it was too horrific for the general public to watch. 
While it was being made, uh, BBC bosses started suspecting that the subject matter uh, would be too extreme for television. The film was scheduled to be broadcast on uh, 6th of August 1945, which is exactly, um, sorry, 6th of August 1965, exactly 20 years after the Hiroshima bombing. But this was delayed so that the film could be shown to cabinet representatives first. But afterwards, the BBC decided not to broadcast the war game, although the organisation has always maintained that it made this decision independently of government influence. Um, the scenes which apparently caused most controversy, um, they, they weren't those showing lines of burnt corpses, and you do get a long tracking shot uh, of uh, nastiness, um, or those showing camps of traumatised uh, survivors. And it wasn't even the scenes um, stating that the government couldn't adequately prepare for nuclear war, which um, were seen as too strong. But it was the scenes showing uh, British bobbies uh, killing civilians, which apparently put the mockers on the war game being shown. And, uh, you know, <laughs> police killing civilians, that's something that's been in the news uh, quite often um, these days, of course. Um, the, the BBC, they, they did arrange several uh, small screenings of the film for, for journalists and politicians. And many of those agree that it, it should remain um, withdrawn. But, however, um, in 1966, some limited cinema screenings were agreed to, and um, CND organised and publicised some of the showings. In the same year, the film won an Oscar for Best Documentary, um, and the war game was finally broadcast by the BBC in 1985, and by that time they'd, they'd made and shown um, a film called Threads, which is sort of similar in tone, but it's even more harrowing. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to watch at times. But um, since the end of the Cold War, uh, nuclear holocaust has been less popular as uh, a subject matter for dystopian fiction. <coughs> but um, pessimistic writers and filmmakers, they've still got uh, plenty of other apocalyptic scenarios to choose from. Uh, and these include environmental destruction in, in films like Waterworld or The Day After Tomorrow. Um, pandemics, as in the, the TV series Survivors, and um, infertility in children of men. Um, so the author can take this situation of some global catastrophe and then imagine how social institutions or, or the characters will cope within it. And there's recently been a resurgence of post-apocalyptic films, with uh, releases like 28 Days Later, um, 2012 and The Road over the last 10 years or so. But, but this development is probably as much to do with um, improvements in computer-generated graphics. Um, these days, you know, it's very easy to create scenes of you know, cities being torn apart and what have you, uh, compared with the past. But there's probably also some truth in the argument that post-apocalyptic fiction um, has eclipsed you know, classic dystopian fiction of the, you know, the 1984 variety um, because of changes in, in our political mindset since the end of the Cold War. Um, since then, there's been the, the widespread view that there is no alternative to capitalism, and therefore there seems to have been, among some people, less reason to imagine a different type of society to capitalism, um, apart from the chaos and barbarism you see in post-apocalyptic fiction. <coughs> but while it may be true that without the, the threat of Soviet Russia, there's not such an obvious alternative society to satirise, but there's still plenty in our capitalist society to extrapolate and criticise using dystopian fiction. So um, recent trends such as the economic downturn, um, environmental concern, bloated bureaucracy and religious division, they're, they're the sort of things which are you know, crying out for dystopias to be written about them. And I'm open to suggestions of recent dystopias which are worth reading. So um, to conclude, how can we use a dystopia as a tool for understanding more about society around us? And it's tempting to judge the worth of a dystopia on whether or not, oh, I'm going to do these again. Um, it's tempting to judge the worth of a dystopia on whether or not what it predicted um, has come true. And I, I suppose I've done this with, by emphasising the machine stops, uh, because obviously that sort of stands out at you. Oh, he's writing about Facebook, you know, that was 100 years ago. So, you know, it's tempting to view dystopias as predictions. But, but this, um, uh, this approach, that, that's led to all the unnecessary rivalry between 1984 and Brave New World as to which is the best dystopia. Um, but as I hope I've shown, um, a dystopia, or indeed any work of fiction, um, it's not really about what predictions it, it, it tries to make. It, it says more about society and the time in which it was written. So, um, in my view, dystopias are best seen as thought experiments, if you like, uh, where a potentially troubling feature of real society 
um, is extrapolated and expanded until it dominates the, the fictional society. So, you know, a good example is CCTV cameras. And, uh, you know, they're extrapolated away from the streets and into people's homes in books like 1984. Or, you know, technology extrapolated into a form where people have become too reliant on it, as in the machine stops. So um, dystopias represent uh, an imaginative kind of slippery slope argument. If you show a relatively minor change to society, such as CCTV cameras, then, you know, if, if you allow that kind of change uh, without challenging it through things like dystopias, then they can become accepted until they sort of dominate society. So therefore, um, a dystopia illustrates what could happen when apparently small changes in society could get out of hand.